Welcome, everybody. Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, the director of career programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of Jeff and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program that is part of the Food Funders 2021 series, um, an afternoon with the World Central Kitchen. This last year has amplified numerous inequalities from health disparities, economic inequalities to racial injustice. And the broken food system is a thread that runs through all of these. This series, um, the, and this is the first part of the series, will bring together creative speakers and special events for funders engaged in harnessing the full potential of food to nourish and transform our communities. Um, and now I wanna introduce Lauren Freed, who is um, a funder and advocate for this work to frame this conversation a bit more and to start us off today. Thank you, Lauren. Hi, um, good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening, wherever you are and welcome everyone. Um, welcome back to this uh, series um, that we've created for food funders. Um, it seems, and I hear in America, it feels like the world is starting to get back to some kind of normal, um, but we all know that the fallout is by no means over. So together with Charlene, we have decided to restart the group for funders interested in food-related initiatives. We know that's a broad spectrum, but it's evident that the global issues we face, whether they're economic inequality, health crises, environmental threats, racial injustices, all of that food insecurity and a broken food system seems to underlie it all. So as funders in this field, we are looking for ways to make a difference. During the last year, what we do may have had to pivot to respond to the crises we have unexpectedly found ourselves in. Just today, we set up a feeding hub for vulnerable members of the Jewish community in London, as the issues we seem to face are here and here to stay for some time. But somehow this feels like a band-aid and the deepest systemic issues and ways to create lasting change are what we really need to address. So who better to start us on our journey? Today, we will be hearing from the team at World Central Kitchen which led by Jose Andres seems the gold standard of doing something really well and really having impact. I'm so excited to see Grace again. We met a few years ago through the Shistam and Reality program in Israel. And from the outset, her willingness to help and her passion for all she does just shone through. She has gone on to achieve impressive things. I feel so proud to know her and you'll soon hear more about what she's been up to. You're also going to see a different person to who was on the advert today. So welcome to Josh Phelps from World Central Kitchen who has kindly stepped in at the last minute to replace Nate Mook, their CEO. Nate has flown to India with Jose to help out with the COVID related crisis there. So that's just a taste of World Central Kitchen in action and we have it live today. So lastly, I'm delighted to welcome back Mitchell Davis as our moderator. Mitchell is the founder and principal of Kitchen Sense, which is a food and food systems consultancy working at the intersection of gastronomy and food politics. His experience ranges from head of strategy from, for the James Beard Foundation to lobbying for change at a policy level to ad advising on the development of the Galilee Culinary Institute that's being developed in Israel now, to most importantly, making the best brunch I've ever tasted in New York City. So welcome. I know we are in great hands as I hand you over and thank you to all of you. Thank you so much, Lauren, and thank you to the Jewish Funders Network for inviting me back to moderate this conversation. I, I wish I could serve you all something. Um, that would be a perhaps a better environment for this intimate and really important conversation about the category we don't always talk about, although Jose Andres has certainly made it front of mind, and that is emergency humanitarian food aid. And I, I know many of you are funders of various types of programs, and all of them, many of them, most of them have to do with feeding people in some way, but but emergency food aid is quite a different beast. Um, and we're going to hear 
uh, from people who um, have not taken the kind of doctrine of how things like that are done, but instead have created an entirely new model. In fact, many different models, models that are, are changed depending on the situation in which they find themselves, which in itself is a new paradigm for administering aid. Um, and they're doing it in a way that um, I think uh, is both uh, amazing and impressive and um, makes us ask some really important questions about how we do things um, as a global community, how we care for ourselves and our communities, local communities within that. So the, uh, I'll say that the, today, the way the conversation is going to go, we'll have about 30 minutes um, talking with uh, Josh and Grace. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for folks listening to ask some questions about 10 minutes. And then we'll go back to a few um, concluding comments from each of our guests, uh, specifically on the topic of philanthropy, since many of you are looking uh, for ways to sort of increase the return on your investment in philanthropy in this particular space. Um, we'll get some opinions from our, our guests who know all about that. Um, uh, and that might be helpful, some very specific advice if, if they have it. Um, so if, if that's okay, we'll we'll get in. And and I, I want to say again, just by means of introduction to this topic, which which I want to impress on you is is a pretty unique um, area, um, different from many people working in different aspects of the food system. Uh, I, I can tell you a few years ago, I was in a very intense conversation, part of a roundtable um, with Earthrin Cousin, who for eight years under the Obama administration was the director of the UN's World Food Program. Um, and she recounted this anecdote that I think is so important for us to think about as we think about how we handle emergency aid. And that is the World Food Program at that time, she was said was very proud to be serving 800 million meals to people, um, to 800 million people, I should say, um, around the world who were in tremendous um, need or, or a crisis. Um, and it took her a while to realize that they were serving the same 800 million people every year, that nothing was actually changing. And I think that idea that we, we build um, systems that we then apply to situations, regardless of the intricacies or details of the situations around the world to deal with them, um, is one of the things that has gotten us, if you will, I mean, it seems a little bit trite to say, but in a rut when it comes to administering aid, we, we put on band-aids rather than look at what has to be done and, and find new approaches um, that serve not just the food, but the, the communities and the people who, um, if you've ever been in a disaster, and frankly, all of us are living through one um, at the moment, the, the, the people need to be um, fed or nourished with more than just calories. Um, and there too lies one of the differences of this program. So we'll start this conversation, I think, um, because it's interesting the, the way that Josh and Grace found themselves in this work uh, is both different. And, and I'll begin, uh, Grace, I, I want to start with you just asking, you're a chef, you've written cookbooks, you're on TV cooking. How on earth did you find yourself feeding, you know, basically saving the restaurant industry to some extent in New York and feeding millions of meals to the five boroughs during a global pandemic that knocked this city on its feet, just get, just in you know two minutes or less. You know, um, the interesting thing is that I, I, I'm such a fan of Jose Andres and World Central Kitchen. Um, I've been with them since Puerto Rico, and I flew down to Puerto Rico because you know it was hard for Jose to pick up the phone. Uh, and I flew down, and I'm like, I'm here. I'm here to help. Uh, put me to work. Um, and then I flew to the Bahamas, and then you know met Josh on the border of Venezuela and Colombia and then flew to Venezuela. So I, I, I love working with these guys. They are my family. Um, we've been through a lot of disasters together. And then a year ago, more or less, um, it's, more, it's now a little bit more than a year, I had COVID early on. And when and I always say this, like when Nate and Jose calls, you always pick up. So they call I'm familiar me. with that phenomenon, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I have COVID, great, get it over with, because you have to go feed New York. And <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I think that, that those words were really like, helped me get through, I understood immediately the magnitude of what was coming. And 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 I, I got better and, and went straight to work. You know, we started in the Bronx with 500 meals and it, and it was, it was something very, um, it was like a miracle, like I knew, you know, from being here in the city for 17 years and knowing that our industry very well. And we started in the Bronx with, you know, with some friends of that were already friends of mine and, and like, 
you know, uh, Michael Blake, which was a, a politician in the Bronx, which I knew very well. So it, uh, it all kind of like aligned for us to go from 500 meals to 100,000 meals, um, including hospitals. And, uh, and it, it, it was a very complex operation, to be honest. I, I still look back and I'm like, how on earth did we do this? But um, it, was, it was a miracle because yes, we not only got to feed New York, but we got to basically, yeah, save over 250 restaurants from closing their doors, which was very impactful, you know, because I would walk into restaurants and they're like, no, you don't understand. You're not only feeding frontline workers, you're not only feeding the community, you're feeding us, you're feeding our families. So that was um, what, you know, what was so impactful about this operation. Wow. Um, so I, I think you've, you've touched on a few themes, I think, that are really important for this audience to understand and for people in general to understand. Um, one of them, I think, is this idea, and you know this firsthand, that, and that chefs get, I mean, we like to say chefs get shit done. You'll pardon my, my Hebrew here. Um, oh, we do. <laughs> yes, and they do. Um, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter where you are in your mise en place in the kitchen, the orders start coming in and people need to eat. And the idea that you deal with what's in front of you, I think has been a model of World Central Kitchen since Jose started it. And it started back in 2010, but it was really, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico that brought the national attention where, where everyone was paralyzed, the government, which couldn't do anything, wasn't doing anything. Um, and they landed and sort of created a, a global phenomenon in that time. So, so let's go to you, Josh. What's a nice guy like you who was managing multi-site oncological clinical trials? I'm, I'm married to a physician who uh, does that kind of work. I, I know what that's like. It is not like getting on a plane and going into the eye of the storm, um, dealing with logistics of feeding hundreds of thousands of people in India, for instance. So how did you get here? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a pretty simple story. I mean, that that sort of work, I was traveling a lot, I was dealing with a lot of logistics and data and things like that. But I mean, the basic is, I had a friend that I grew up with in Virginia who surfed, and he was an air traffic controller in Puerto Rico. So I used to visit as much as I could, you know, six, seven years straight, uh, multiple times a year. So I, I knew people who, you know, grew up there who were transplants there. And when Hurricane Maria happened, um, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to go immediately, but you know, maybe a month or so in, uh, my mom came up, visited me in Washington, DC. We packed a bag full of like life straws and just stuff that a friend of mine on the, um, on the Western side of the island in Rincon had asked for. And I went, uh, dropped that off. And then I, I, you know, was going on Facebook and wherever I, and the website for World Central Kitchen. I mean, I knew of Jose because of the restaurants and I live in DC, but just got a hold of somebody and just said, what can I do? And um, I mopped floors in the kitchen for a few days because, you know, I, I, uh, they, they had plenty of chefs, they had plenty of people cooking and doing things like that. And I just wanted to help however I could. Um, and then, you know, not too long after that, a volcano went off in Guatemala where I'm involved in another nonprofit. And uh, I went there, you know, I've been going there for eight years and just it, stuff just he started to keep happening where I had uh, friends or family and, um, you know, I went down there and then I just kept, uh, I had a, my schedule, I made it myself and I just kept showing up. And I think that's how a lot of us joined World Central Kitchen um, is that, you know, you just, that people they could trust and keep showing up and, and people they know, you know, Grace mentioned and, and she gave such a wonderful description of what she was doing in New York. And I would like to second that a thousand percent. They know who they can call and they can count on. Um, and, and, and if that's, uh, what you are and you want to keep doing it, I feel like there's always going to be a place to work with World Central Kitchen. Sadly, there will always be a crisis. Um, and we know that the climate crises are increasing with frequency. And so it turns out are the political crises, the government, the failure of government to be able to act and also to have brought on man-made crises. So I want to I, I want to ask, I, I, well, I, again, I, I think it's important for folks to understand, um, you know, can you describe either of you what what a kind of old model of emergency humanitarian aid it might might have looked like? And you know, I see helicopters dropping fortified Snicker bars on on people. And and can either of you um, venture to give a give a frame a little bit for what traditionally this space might have looked like? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, I think I think. Um... 
you know, an older model and a model that that maybe still exists and for good reason is, you know, doing doing research, you know, taking a little while to get your bearings and, and get in and where where there is there people are hungry, like Nate and Jose like to say, people are hungry now, not in a week. So there is going to be a need for that sort of thing eventually. But you know, what we are trying to do is is address the now. Um, so, you know, if there's a hurricane, we typically uh, show up before it hits. And s s some people say that's smart, some say it's silly, but it works for us. You know, we're trusted enough by uh, people that will bring in, you know, refrigerated containers full of food and we'll find a kitchen and be ready to go. Um, you, you sort of have that, you know, luxury might not be the right word, but with, with, with a hurricane, you, you can kind of tell it's coming. And this is, you know, since, since Maria. Um, you know, fire is the same in California, you have a little bit of lead time. And so we just want to be in place to be cooking immediately, sometimes the night before the storm hits for first responders and everybody like that. So I think, you know, that is our, uh, you know, our ethos is to uh, start early and keep going um, until, you know, other sources may come in for that long term impact, not to say we don't do long term programming, especially now. Um, I mean, the pandemic project, I, I mean, Grace could tell you how long New York went and how, what a behemoth it was. And, and it really set the template for us feeding, you know, thousands, uh, working with thousands of restaurants around the nation, hundreds of cities, you, you know, nearly every state. But um, to me, you know, what I've seen in the last four years or so working with World Center Kitchen, that's, that's more of a matter of set, our, our directive is set to um, get on the ground as soon as possible, assess, like our, we have a director of emergency relief, Sam Block, and he's also, you know, one of the folks who was probably knocking on Grace's door to get out of bed when she finally got over COVID um, and just go, you, you know, and, the, and to know what you don't know and work with people like Grace who have, you know, so many contacts around the city. And I'm sure we'll talk more about it later. I mean, she, she really did everything from help set the program up to quality control because of her versatile skill set, which kept her very busy. Uh, but, you know, we, we love to have her and working with her anytime we can. You know, I think that, you know, Josh couldn't have said it better. I think the key for us has been also, you know, be not reactive, but we've been proactive, you know, and I think that also is, it's the key has been all of our contacts, you know, Jose knows everyone and and i think that he's been so clever to really allocate people that have you know a, a very strong network of people and like you said you know us chefs we're gonna call a chef and we're gonna open the kitchen and we're gonna you know we're gonna turn that stove on and if not we're gonna make a fire so so it's that kind of go attitude um that that is so that it's in our DNA, you know, <laughs> because literally that's that's the thing. Like you said, you know, a bunch of chefs, we get together, we're gonna get it done. And right. we're gonna feed people and there's no one stopping us and we're gonna call our suppliers and we're gonna call someone who knows someone else, and, and it's gonna happen. So I think that that um, World Center Kitchen has been a true testament to that. And 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 just like Jose says, you know, we start and we trust. And, and, and it is like that, you know, we are like, we don't wait. Oh, but how are we going to figure this out? No, it's always kind of like, you know, like like they're saying, we're we're building the the tracks as we're going, uh, as that train is moving. We're building the tracks, but you know what? It, it it happens because I think that also energetically, when you're doing this kind of work, things just that energy drives you to find the right things to a door. A, you know, one door closes, another one opens, and you just keep going. And I think that that and that is a testament. To Jose and Jose and his energy, it's like that. So I think we all under him follow that 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 attitude. You know, we just okay, it's gonna happen. And I think that 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 we we saw it firsthand. Well, you know, it was it was it was good for other organizations to come in, right? Uh, because we were like, okay, guys, yes, we've been doing this for five months. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I think that that's. That's kind of like the speed of, of World Central Kitchen, you know. Um. Why is it important? Oh, let me remind folks uh, listening that you can ask questions in the Q&A. Um, if you look down at your screen, this is the webinar Zoom model, and then we'll get to them at the end. Or if they work into the conversation naturally, I'm happy to, to bring them up. 
why bother making fresh hot food in these situations where you know there may not be gas or you may maybe the firewood's wet or maybe you know couldn't we just bring in i don't know pop in for instant ramen or like what's why go through the logistic complications and even the man power necessary to make fresh hot food yeah, I mean, it all boils down to the fact that, you know, we want to serve people a meal that, you know, they enjoy as nutritious, but also uh, with dignity and empathy and, you know, best we can. Um, that is, is something that, you know, a, a meal that, you know, depending on what country we're in or what part of the nation we might be in, if it's domestically in the USA, something that people enjoy. And that's another benefit to working with chefs who, you uh, if they don't know that cuisine, they'll do the research and they know what to order and how to make delicious meals that you can make in, you know, many large amounts from thousands to tens of thousands in a day. Um, and it just boils down to showing that, you know, people are very surprised, like on day one, when you're out there and maybe you're, maybe you have a truck full of meals and you're driving around after a hurricane and you, you come upon a neighborhood and people are cleaning up and, you know, maybe it's even still raining or stuff like that. And, and, and it's very shocked a lot of times when you show up with a hot meal, <laughs> um, but extremely appreciative, you know, a lot of times, a lot, a lot of tears sometimes on both sides, but um, you know, we're there to just show people that people care about them and to uh, you know, if they don't have to worry about how they're feeding themselves or their family, there's a lot of other things that you have to worry about after a disaster, whether natural or, you know, in, in this case of the last year, the pandemic. So um you know for for us that's why we do it and, and 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 that's the reason you know we're here there are a lot of groups that provide a lot of different types of meals and you know but like if jose sees an mre becomes visibly like agitated so um if he sees somebody's eating mre somewhere he's like well okay we need to make sure that that is not the meal that they're eating over the next starting you know next meal time let's get them something else because it's not as, you know, we, we have some folks on our team who, who have been in the military and they're like, yeah, I mean, that's like less, that's for us walking, you know, 20 miles a day somewhere, you know, there's so much sodium and things like that and preservatives. So uh, that, you know, that's the reason we do it. And, and that's also the reason like we work with chefs because they know how to do it. Therese? Yeah, I also think that it's, it's, it's interesting because in a disaster, and I have one quick story, you know, um, when we went to the Bahamas, there were a lot of Haitians that were misplaced um, in this stadium. And, and you know, Jose goes, let's make them their national dish. Try frying 600 pounds of pork and plantains <laughs> and rice and beans. And I was like, no, I was like, no, we are going to feed them something else. I'm not frying 600 pounds of pork. And of course I can't tell Jose no, but I, I did, but I didn't. Um, and then, you know, we went to serve the meal because it was like, it was a lot. It was a lot of frying. And and like almost the sprinklers went on and we were like, we almost blew the kitchen of, of the, of what we were cooking. It was insane. And, and I was so upset, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to, obviously I'm here to serve. And, but we could have done something else. And you know what? We went in and we went to the stadium and people were, crying the line was they were like thank you for making us feel home for a night yeah. thank you for reminding us that there's hope thank you for and and i wasn't there i don't even know what the national dish is and i'm crying <laughs> like right now it was like it was i i had to shut up and i was like that's right like if i would have put myself in that position and i would have you know ate in my national dish from venezuela when i am literally sleeping in the floor of a stadium for weeks and I have an arepa or a, a pabellón, I would be like, oh my God, like I'm reminded of home. I'm reminded that there is hope. And and that's like on one scenario of, of being, you know, somewhere like in the Bahamas where everything was destroyed. But here in New York, you know, people were literally hungry. Like the lines that, I, that we would see of people queuing up for food in Queens, in the Bronx, were people that were without jobs. You know, there's, I saw basically our industry suffering, you know, our dishwashers, our line cooks. These are people that that didn't have any benefit from the government. You know, the paycheck stopped, that's it. And they still have a family back home and, you know, 
in Mexico or Nicaragua or wherever, you know, that they're that they're constantly feeding and sending the money to. And the minute our industry shut down, the minute they didn't have any money to even eat. So I think that there was, you know, there's there's so many extreme um, and, and different stories that I we could write a, a book, uh, an encyclopedia, uh, right now. But but what? First of all, food is life. So if you're not eating, you're not functioning. And and it's so transformative what it does to someone who can eat at least one hot meal a day. It's it is life changing. It's it's like you feel hopeful and you feel so grateful and you feel like you can keep going. Amazing and inspiring. Um, I want to I want to I want to talk a little bit more detail about the New York experience because it, it's been written about in a few places as a totally different model of delivery, both scalable and um, regenerative. And I think it's important for folks to understand because I, as I, I know whether you're landing in um, India or uh, after a hurricane or wherever it is that, that you go, you, you, what, what you have in common is you're hitting the ground running, you're looking for ways to feed, there will be hungry people and you are going to figure out how to feed them fresh hot food. But the what you have to use can be quite different. Um, and the part of the old model is kind of, you know, after all the planning and when you finally get on the ground is you're applying your system to this situation. But you guys, I think, at least my understanding, go in and really figure out what's there, how you can put the pieces together, you know, gather Jose's credit cards and go to the Costco and all that sort of stuff, pull the stuff out of the, the abandoned restaurant refrigerators, et cetera. But here, oh, and, and I should say more, very importantly, your solutions are not always, if you look at the spreadsheet, the most um, take advantage of the most economies of scale. That that the actual return on what you are doing, and especially this the story of New York as it's being told now, it may not be the cheapest way to get food or calories into people, but it also isn't sort of um, exploitative in that you're using what's in the community. You went into the restaurants, you paid, you you diverted money to restaurants that kept people employed, that kept communities functioning in this very difficult time. And because of that, um, ultimately, obviously, the return is bigger, but also the scalability, the ability to, without having to build kitchens, without having to cart in things, you sort of used the infrastructure that was there. And when we look at what's left of the restaurant industry, and the reason I'm saying this is, you know, everyone I know in the business is trying to find a way to um, to better operationalize the assets they have to increase revenue because the cost of doing business is going up. And one of the ways is to help feed people as, as you know, one of the opportunities to, to use what you have and the skill set that you have and the people's uh, labor skills that you have is to use them. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about um, that particular, both from a logistics standpoint, but also from a kind of ecosystem um, economic approach, um, you know, how that model works and how what people might learn from that for other situations. Um, I actually want to let Grace talk mostly about that because she lived it and got off the ground, but I'll just give a quick note. Um, you know, we we were when we were talking about that idea in, in our office in Washington, DC, I don't remember where I was flying back from, but I met with Nate um, and our other uh, director of Chef Ops, Tim, and they talked about what the price could be for a restaurant to, you know, be able to make a nice meal, uh, use the packaging, like keep those folks without a social safety net employed. And we were sitting there like with the chef um, and owner Rose from from Maidan, an amazing Michelin star restaurant in DC, who ended up being one of our, our first people to, you know, just discuss this with us and talk about how we could get it off the ground. Um, and I think you, you just, you touched on it, right? We were able to help people at least keep the lights on, if not be extremely profitable, but also like keep some employees on, ro rotate and everything. And one thing that I heard a lot was, People who never had takeout, like Maidan, they developed, they they had to pivot. And you know, chefs are very creative, and they were able to do that. And I really do think it set a lot of people off with a, a new revenue stream. But um, you know, that is sort of where the idea was born out of. But it really didn't, you know, we didn't hit the gas on it until a New York. And, and and Grace was part of that from beginning to end. And and I don't know, Grace, if you want to talk about too, like the the hospital thing was even different, you know. And and you and you. You have, you, you know, you, there is a, you want to make sure one thing when we have our own kitchen, we can obviously have a lot of oversight over, over quality, but, you know, I think Grace had a monumental task of, of over, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 kitchens. So, and, and, and she could tell you how that all worked in New York. 
No, I think it, it was, and I just want to be clear because I was reading in the Q&A um, that, that, you know, we fed a very unhealthy meal for um, for the Bahamas and, and like actually New York operations very different from a natural disaster. And we do take nutrition very serious. And that was one of my jobs, making sure that every meal was balanced, that it was healthy, that it had a lot of greens and all of my all of my restaurants can tell you um, that I was like, put more greens, garnish, put more greens, garnish. And I was so like adamant about nutrition, right? Um, so so for me, it was, it's, it's very different when you're feeding people long-term, right? Than when there's a, a natural disaster and someone on a Friday night, we are feeding them a treat. And that was what Jose wanted to do um, for those people that were missing home. And we knew exactly who our target audience was because we asked everyone. I was like, basically 99% of the people there were Haitians and that was their national dish. And that was what they wanted to do. And we also serve a vegetarian option always. So just to clarify that point. Um, and then New York was very complex because we had, so we were doing you know, everything was closed and we wanted to first, it was again, respond as quick as possible. People were hungry and it was very scary at the beginning. So we had to work with one large supplier who would be able to handle volume, right? So we had, because we had a lot of people to feed, um, you know, the Bronx, Queens, Harlem, um, Staten Island, and people were making lines. And again, this was back when you know, the schools were having some kind of school meals, but again, it was an apple, a banana and a sandwich. So we needed to act very quickly and we hired one large supplier at first, and then we we turned it into um, Chefs for America, which was, okay, um, we came up with this model that we would buy meals from restaurants at, a, a, you know, a, at a decent price and it was, it was, win-win for everyone because again they were they didn't have any anything coming in so we were able to work with restaurants to say okay i one of my jobs was i would coach you through what you can do for this amount that is healthy that is nutritious that it's good that it's warm and that it's up to our standards so what that was one of my jobs like really working hand in hand because it, it was hard you know we had we had chefs, we had Angie Mar from the Beatrice and who's, you know, her restaurant does $45 minimum like plate, like, and she was wonderful, but I, but literally she was like, okay, wait, how can I work from my, my kitchen from, you know, we have to take that into consideration. How many meals can you make from your kitchen? What can you do? Uh, this is what's good with, this is what suits, this is what's, you know, what people would like to eat. So, um, New York was very complex because then we had our hospitals and and we were very sensitive about, you know, for none of the operation in New York had any pork, any shellfish, like, and we also had, um, you know, a kosher option. So we had a kosher option, we had our vegetarian option, and we had our, our, our standard meal. So it, imagine the complexity of, of, of that, um, of really understanding, um, you know, hospitals were very different from the community. So that's when hospitals, you know, and there was 30,000 meals that came um, that we, we fed 16 of New York public hospitals. So I think it was, it was it's very complex to understand um, everyone and try to please everyone. Mind you, we couldn't please absolutely everyone, but I think that overall, uh, we were very successful at having options and being and we being very culturally sensitive and really working with restaurants to have for them to succeed because we wanted them to shine, we wanted them to be proud, and we wanted the community to receive that meal with that love, integrity, and 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 a balanced hot meal. So I think that. It's it, it's very complex. <laughs> I, it would take like a lot of hours to explain, but um, but I think there I was think, another question that um, I don't want to. Well, I, I want to put two together. Um, yeah. 
So it's pretty obvious when you, your services are needed, <laughs> there's an emergency, um, you, you sometimes you know a little bit in advance, but how do you know when you're done or when, when, when do you leave a situation? And, and to add another question to that that I think is related, and, and do you think about what you're leaving behind? Is some of this work intended to plant seeds, if you'll forgive me, um, for some community self-sufficiency or agency or resiliency in the future, or do you have wait for other organizations to take on that work and you go on to the next crisis? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And, and again, that can be complicated as well. I mean, somebody I saw in the chat mentioned people um, who are becoming, uh, potential to become reliant on, on what we're doing. And I mean, our goal is to you know, not overstay our welcome, especially uh, in, a, in emergency feeding when there are other groups that come in with long-term solutions, but we do like to stay as long as we're needed. Um, that said, uh, you know, we do also have a resilience team and what they're doing is, um, you know, setting up long-term solutions to, to help folks, you know, build back infrastructure, um, you know, support farmers. Uh, they have a grantee program in, in the Bahamas, in Puerto Rico, a lot of the places where we've activated and there's potential to, we have a, a large presence in the Caribbean, there's potential to continue the work we're doing in, in islands like St. Vincent. I just got back there where we've been there for about seven weeks feeding folks who were displaced from the volcano. Um, and I can use that a, as an example. We just work closely with their uh, national you know, emergency response team. Um, you know, we when we go into a place, we usually, especially during disasters, we plug in with emergency response, um, government as needed, but but more more so just to say, hey, we're here and this is what we're doing, and you know, we'll we'll come to meetings when we can, but we'll keep you very informed, um, and just build that relationship, and then they keep us informed. You know, when are the shelters closing? When are people going back home? When is when is power back on? I mean, utilities, um, we've had to build out relationships with utilities, water, power, just to know, one, to get the kitchen set up and, and be cooking safely, but also, you know, when will folks uh, be able to return home? Uh, when will the, you know, food systems that, that perhaps are broken during a disaster be coming back online? Um, because like, you know, there was an instance too where uh, we, we, we always serve a ton of fruit, you know, with our meals and we were buying up too much of it in St. Vincent. So we had to dial it back a little bit. Um, we brought some in from Miami, um, you know, on the ship and stuff, but, you know, just just keeping our ears to the ground and, and also talking to the local producers. We, we try and use local produce as much as possible. So, um, you know, it's just, it's not a, a science per se, but you, you can kind of tell when, when there's extra food around after a disaster, it's when you start looking at a way to pull out and, and also not hurt the stores and the restaurants that are starting to, to come back and everything. So um, we also have started to see uh, group, you mentioned World Food Program earlier. Um, we this year got our first grant with them. They saw what we were doing in Guatemala, feeding folks after hurricanes Ada and Iota. And we just had a, a team down there um, led by one of our employees, uh, Fatima Castillo. And they just saw the, you know, she knew the lay of the land. We had built two teams getting hot meals. And then we started to uh, deliver their um, bags of, of more dry goods and, and rice and commodities like that. And, you know, also they were, they, they saw where we were delivering food and they, they were, this, we shared the info with them. And then that's where they could also start doing their cash voucher programs and things like that to support local businesses. So, um, you know, the ecosystem, I think, with the people that we interact with is growing all the time, but we definitely do take care to, you know, to, to do, um, to do good and, and, and not harm any communities or food systems or, you know, have people develop uh, a reliance. Anything to add to that, Grace? Well, I think that um, I, I was reading the, the chat. So I think that also the work that we've done in Puerto Rico with the farmers, is it's out it's outstanding you know it's, it's it's an island that yeah we were there for a while and then Jose said you know and the, the work we do in Haiti with we basically have uh, also um like a school like a cooking school so I think that that um you know I think that what 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 you hear more in the news is is us as an emergency response team because that's what we do and we do very well but I think that in all the you know, areas that we've been, we've been able to set up more long-term, um, 
you know, more long-term sustainable models. Like for example, in Puerto Rico, we're supporting um, farmers and and then in Haiti, you know, a school, basically a cooking school was was built um, for that. Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, it, maybe it wasn't physically built, but there's a program that we have in Haiti that um, where we teach cooking classes and, and, and it's amazing. And then in Venezuela, for example, we've been there, people don't know this, but we've been there for years um, feeding, you know, basically this schools, different schools, comedores, who over a thousand kids a day um, that we're still feeding in, in Venezuela because the situation is still horrific and, and with COVID even, even more. Um, and then, you know, that's, I think we've been able to, in the places that really need it, um, kind of adapt different models. Um, but I, I think that that also people need to understand, you know, World Central Kitchen is a very young organization. Yes. We, we haven't we haven't been uh, doing this uh, for, you know, such a long time. And we've been trying, like, like Jose says it all the time, like we've been, you know, as we go and grown, try to experiment with D different models because at the beginning we were just a chef relief team that would provide aid in times of, of natural disasters. The thing is we've we've been evolving um, and we we're growing and we're all growing. I think that we've all been able to grow with the organization and you know like in New York we did oh wait now you know people are asking us they, they really want to cook at home. They were asking for more you know veggies and dry goods so we we designed a, a farmer's market program where we had, you know, a box full of vegetables and, and, and dried goods. So I think that, um, you know, we, we've been figuring out a lot of things as, as we, we've gone, we go. Well, speaking of things as they're happening, one of the questions in the chat is about, um, you know, we lost Nate to India. Um, how did you decide, what was it that tipped um, you over, how did you decide and what are you going to be doing there? Yeah, um, you know, as as the pandemic has started to slow down in certain places, I think everyone's pretty aware that in, in India, it's ramped up and, and been the worst that it, that it has been uh, since the inception of COVID. So um, there's a chef there, uh, Sanjeev, and I don't recall his last name, but I know he's uh, very well known in, in India. And we just started talking to him. He was already uh, feeding healthcare workers during the crisis. And, um, you know, we have a relationship with him and uh, we reached out and just said, hey, look, you know, we see what's going on here. It's kind of reminding us of like the beginning, right, of, of in New York and all these other places where people are working around the clock. They don't it, you know, stores aren't open, they can't go shopping. I mean, it, it's it's just, you know, there's so many things happening that people are just sleeping at the hospital. So uh, we are working, I want to say now across 10 cities, uh, working with a lot of ho hotels that can just do bulk cooking. I mean, that's where when we were in the Bahamas cooking, uh, you know, out of Nassau, we had access to the Atlantis, <laughs> like, you know, banquet kitchen. So that's what we have access to over there. Um, and we're doing about 20,000 meals a day. I think we've done about 250,000. And, you know, our, our thing is like with complete, you know, trust in our partners, it still makes a big difference for us to get on the ground and, and see the work. And, um, you know, Jose, uh, Nate, another, two of our other colleagues, Tim and Zami, were able to work out um, getting over there, um, you know, getting the proper visas right now and things like that, just to go there and just be on the ground support, show what we're doing. I mean, that's an important part. I mean, you know, showing what, what World Central does, our comms team is amazing, but it's also a need. I mean, I think we, we're even in like the Twitter algor algorithm as a news organization because of the places we go and how, how soon we post from being on the ground where, you know, Hurricane Michael, uh, I think it was two weeks in, and Jose came down and he did an interview with CNN. It was the first like live interview because just, there was no hotels or anywhere in the panhandle that uh, anyone, for anyone to stay at. I mean, we were sleeping on the gym floor of the emergency operations center. There was some national guard and guns and every, everything just kind of snoozing there next to us. I, I had a nice mat by the bench press, which so I could hang stuff on it and everything. But, you know, being there is really important, even, even if the world does have eyes on it, um, you know, just going there and supporting our partners. So 
that has been in the works for you know the last week or two just getting it all sorted obviously travel still um a maze uh, you know that we're all navigating as as covid uh, in some places opens the world back up but um yeah so they got on a plane last night at six and i think it's about 2 a.m there now and they landed uh two hours ago so i know nate would have loved to be here but um, i'm happy that i can tell that story for you i think it's hard for people to understand that that there are the people affected by an emergency or a crisis of some kind, but then there are the people who are caring for them who need help. My, I mean, as I said earlier, my husband's a physician who was the chair of palliative medicine at Mount Sinai. And um, and when you guys came with food, uh, you know, when there was hot food, his staff who were dealing, you know, with the most horrendous grief every day, um, it really was a bit of hope and sunshine in their day uh, for them. Let's change the, I, there's a great question, I think, in the chat uh, for you, Grace, um, and even to hear the story, I, I mean, Joss sleeping on the floor next to the bench press, it's kind of a macho sounding place um, or space, let's say, you know, we're here to, the, the, the Rangers have arrived and we're, we're here to save the day. Um, what's it like, in, in addition to being a chef, um, you know, where there are fewer, although increasingly more uh, women um, in this kind of you know, hero place, cooking as a woman, you know, organizing teams of men in, in cultures, maybe that it's even, even more rare for women to be in charge. But what's that been like to navigate? Well, thank God I grew up with male cousins, lots of them. So I am, I, I can take it. Um, it's very complicated. It's very complex, but I just don't let it get to me. And these guys are amazing. They have my back and, and, you know, like, but, no man likes to be told what to do by a Latina woman. <laughs> unless they are, unless they're my Mexican people, they they can take it. <laughs> they can take it. Um, uh, no, I think that you need to come in, you need to come in very um, from a from a very loving place, and I think that that is um, my my way to navigate the complexity of of this um, of of our industry has been, first of all, from a very humble place, from a very, I, 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 I always like to learn, I'm always learning. Uh, so I'm very empathetic, but I'm very firm. <laughs> and that's what I was able to, to um, tell, you know, people who were cooking 100,000 meals for us what to do every day, because it came from a very, I get you, it's hard. I've done it because I've been with these guys in the Bahamas cooking 10,000 meals a day. So you cannot tell me that I haven't done it. You know, I've been in Venezuela where we were, you know, under very uncomfortable circumstances. But um, but you know what? Like, I get it, but it needs to get done. And I think that the kitchen is it's it is very complex. And I, and I again, I can tell you stories for days of of uh, of I, I, I've cried a lot and um, and and it is, but thank God I have a have a team, I had a team that was amazing that we were able to support each other. And, and and I think that you need to always be surrounded by people that that get you, that are gonna have your back, and that you can vent with. Because Josh was one of them, you know, Tim and Josh, and I, we were on a chat, the three of us, and I was like, guys, I'm ready to have a meltdown. So I've had, a, I I did, I had a lot of meltdowns. But I wouldn't show it. I would just be like, okay, guys, help me navigate this situation, you know? And I think that was very important because you, you, as a woman, it is very complex and you need to ask the boys for help a lot of times and be like, I don't know how to navigate this situation. Right. Um, and, 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 and it is, I'm learning every day, every day, every day, something, <laughs> every, every day there is something, but every day I learn, I learn to, to, and I, and I think you have to, to listen a lot. And I think you have to just hide your tongue a lot your and, tongue. and, and keep going and really not let it, not let it get, the thing was not let it get in your head. You know, I, I, I am, I am a person. I can't keep letting this thing that I'm a woman and that is why they're treating me this way. I'm a person, I'm not gonna figure it out. So that's been my way of coping with, with the very, um, complex situation of being a woman in, in the kitchen and in these kinds of reliefs. But I got to say that I, I work with the best team. I have, these guys are amazing. Um, so, mm. so and 
that's been the key. <laughs> it, it really does sound like I'm talking with war correspondents, I have to say, which I, I have a few friends in the biz. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, what you are doing, what you have done is really amazing and inspiring. Um, I want to take the last few minutes we have to, because of the audience that, that is listening, to ask you from you from what you've seen, and not just in the World Central Kitchen space, but you both have kind of vast experience um, uh, in other with other organizations also. Uh, you know, this is a group of people who are tr are trying to um, give money and and other things to organizations to help them to fill the holes or gaps to to have to create um, long lasting change um, to. You know, not just to give money for charity, but to um, change the systems in some cases, or or even to sort of bring a bigger return on, on on what they can do with their investments, if we can use that word. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, you know, what advice do you have for folks directly in in the emergency relief space, but even more broadly in the food and and philanthropy sectors? I mean, for us, one thing we like to always mention is that. Um, you know where where your uh, philanthropic dollars are going. Um, you know we can tell you how much the meal cost is uh, down to the penny, uh, whether it's us cooking or a restaurant program. Um, our overhead is uh, is not considered part of what any any donations come to World Central Kitchen. So we hope that that gives people some comfort, but then also the transparency of, you know. Of just knowing, seeing what we're doing, you know, with our, our communications, whether that be out on social media or the stories that we tell in, in, in our outreach and emails and things like that. And also, I think, I like to think that, you know, most of us are, are pretty available to talk to, um, you know, across various platforms. You know, you, you may not always get uh, Jose on the phone, but I, I feel like it's pretty easy to get, you know, Grace or myself or Nate or other people if you want to really get some granular details or talk to our development team. I mean, we are pretty much an open book. And I think that helps, um, you know, maybe I don't always want to be like in the wind and the rain. I felt weird the first time doing selfie videos from a hurricane going through, but I think it really brings people to, to where you are. I mean, cause it, it, to, to be honest with so much going on in the world and there was, we had the most active hurricane season in history last year while dealing with the pandemic. So, um, you know, the news cycle moves so, so fast, we do feel obligated to just keep hopefully keep people's minds, um, if not minds on, but at least, um, you know, keep them aware of what's going on in the different disasters we react to. So um, I would just say, you know, I would never I would tell everyone where to put their philanthropic dollars, but I do, I do like the way we approach it in terms of just being an, a very transparent. I also like to tell people that, you know, this changed a little bit during the pandemic, but as we open up, I mean, you know, people can and should donate to, you know, medical associations, whether that's for cancer research or, you know, American Heart Association, but you're never going to be able to go in there. Uh, you, usually you might be able to pull some strings but to, to, uh, do, to do the surgery yourself. But, you know, Jose also likes to say even a five-year-old can make a sandwich and that's true. Um, so we do uh, encourage people to volunteer with us. People do sometimes travel to meet with us. Um, you know, we, we have a focus usually on working with volunteers from the area affected because that can be a big part of the cathartic and healing process. But, um, you know, like I said, the first thing I did when I volunteered was mop floors. So, and that's needed because you needed you yeah. need to have a clean kitchen as uh, I've been told by many chefs. <laughs> so, um, you know, that that's, uh, that's, that's part of what's special to me is being able to, uh, if you want to um, actually participate in, in, in some of the, the um, difference that you're making with philanthropy. Thanks, Grace. You know, I think that that for um, for here for our folks, it's we our our model again is very different um, from any model. But I have to say that one thing that I did see a lot is, and 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 again, I don't. I think I respect every organization who's because if you're doing this kind of work, most likely your heart is in the right place and you're trying to do the right thing. There's a question as well regarding food waste. If you don't understand your audience, where it's going and what people want and need, there's a lot of food waste. I mean, there's a lot of organizations trying to do great work, but they send you know, folks in Harlem who are older food that they don't want to eat. And if they don't wanna eat that, it goes to waste. 
So I think that that it is very important for organizations to understand, uh, and I think that we do that very well. We do we do really take the time to, and, and you know every single week I was I was auditing who our food was going to, where it was going, literally checking garbage cans. If I saw food being wasted, we got to pull back. We got to pull back. We got to cut back the meals. We were feeding. It's it, now it's too much. Just exactly because of that, you know, it's just like Josh said at the beginning, when when you are doing this kind of work, you just have to be very aware of your surroundings and what's going on and you have to be on the ground. And that's what I think we do also very well. We are hyper on top of everything. And then we are realizing, okay, food is being wasted. We gotta go, we gotta pull back, <laughs> right? Or this is not going well. You, you, All you have to do is it's look at the trash cans. Um, uh, so I think that that is something that that we're very extremely aware of. Jose really, really dislikes food waste. Um, it's his, it's his thing. So um, we we are hyper sensitive to to that. And yeah, I think that that's that's one thing that I wanted to to touch upon while um, looking at the chat and kind of summarizing it all. Thank you. I think looking at the time, I should probably pass this back over to Charlene, but I. I just want to th thank the two of you. I, I am so inspired. I feel so lazy. I'll tell you that. And um, and I just think the you know the both the flexibility, the resilience, the energy, and the inspiration that that is represented by what you're doing and what the organization stands for, I think could be used in so many different areas of of aid and help and philanthropy because it isn't as you say it's not. It's not delivering a solution. It's actually working with the folks to find, you know, what needs to be done and getting it done. And I think we just need more of that in, from our governments, from our communities, from everybody, so our organization. So, thank you for all of the work that you do on behalf of the global community and the food community. Um, and it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much, Mitchell, for being such a um, a terrific interviewer. I think you're, the price of your success is that we've asked you to do additional interviews because you're just so effective and wonderful and we're so grateful to you and to Grace and to you, Josh, you stepped in and you really you know, just hit it out of the park. Um, I'm reflecting, I think, similarly to Mitchell. I'm, I'm sort of blown away by all that's been accomplished. And I'm also thinking even beyond the, the food system where you have created, World Central Kitchen has created, but really your efforts and your leadership has created both small and large scale change and also both um, direct service and systemic change. And you balance that every day. And that's something that we as philanthropists are constantly weighing. And I feel like that, especially in the food system, because we often get the question, you know, that's unanswerable. Do we either feed people, you know, or do we um, make sort of larger scale investments, but if maybe people have to go hungry and then, and it's always that, that way. And you've really articulated the, the balance really, really well and used sort of, and taught us more broadly from a philanthropic perspective that we must be nimble. We must be adaptive. We must course correct. We must think like chefs, I guess, is what, is what, even though I really can't, cook. You don't want to taste my brunch, Lauren, that's for sure. Um, but we have to think more like that. We have to think about ingredients. We have to think about being creative and we have to like really react in real time. And I think COVID has certainly forced us to do that. And, you know, the world forces us to do that. So just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple other announcements before I ask Tamar to, to sort of close those up. Uh, this is the first of a three-part series. The second is taking place on June 30th. We're gonna have sort of a peer round table and a chance just for each of us food funders to share what we're doing, what we're interested in. We'll send more info out. And then I'm actually in Jerusalem right now and I'm super excited um, that we will be hopefully getting together in person in October as part of the Jewish Funders Network Ideas Festival and seeing some terrific models here on the ground in Israel. Um, and so we'll really look forward to sending out more details and information then. And um, 
I want to also just let everybody know um, that this session was recorded because a number of people couldn't join us, but really, really wanted to hear the conversation. And so I think JFN will send the recording out. And if anybody wants to forward it on, you know, this was just great. And I finally just want to end with a thank you to, to Lauren, to Lauren Freed, my sort of partner in this and the the instigator and architect of today's program. Um, it's just a joy to work with you. So thank you. So Tamar, do you want to wrap us up? From thank JFN? you so much, Arlene. So I'll just echo everybody's thank you. Um, Mitchell, Grace, and Josh, thank you so much. And of course, Charlene and Lauren who have really been championing this issue for us here at JFN to make sure that funders understand how they can be, um, you know, what's out there and how they can be impactful. So. Um, Thank you, Charlene, for bringing up the program that we're going to have next month. And I hope to see a lot of you there and to be continued. Um, this is such an important conversation in so many ways to look at it. So, so really happy to, to create this platform for everybody to come together and, and learn and, and network with each other. So thank you again, Grace, Josh, and Mitchell for all that you do every day and for spending your time with us today and sharing. And I wish everybody well and have a great day, everybody.